3,137 men from the Teesside area died for King and Country during the Great War of 1914 to 1918. Some of the men named on these panels, such as Henry Cook, Henry Bloom and Harold Champney, served in a local battalion designated by the War Office as the 12th Battalion Service Yorkshire Regiment, but popularly known as the Teesside Pioneers. When the First World War broke out, Middlesbrough in the northeast of England was a relatively new industrial town near the mouth of the River Tees. It was a town which had developed quickly. The population grew from 5,500 in 1841 to over 100,000 in 1911. Incorporated as a county borough council in 1853, its prosperity was built on heavy industry iron and steel and shipbuilding. Gladstone had said of the town, a remarkable place, the youngest child of England's enterprise is an infant, but if an infant, an infant Hercules. In 1914 a loaf of bread cost a penny and so did a pint of milk or beer. A shilling would get you a pound of butter or a two pound bag of sugar. Middlesbrough citizens, like the rest of the country worried by European news, tried to cling to their peaceful avocations. We had our fill of doily cart opera, had seen the Count of Luxembourg and the Chocolate Soldier, sung and whistled just a song of twilight, and we danced to Alexander's ragtime band and Hitchiku. The barn dance was danced to the tune of There Was I Waiting at the Church, and the Valletta was danced to Daisy Daisy. The sun also played its part. May was fine, but June was flaming and the sun was triumphant. The June 30th mid-afternoon temperature in Albert Park touched 80 degrees Fahrenheit. This was followed by a midnight of such unseasonal oppressiveness that hundreds of families spent the night on their doorsteps. Then, July 1st, the day opened with thunderstorms. But as tensions mounted in Europe, the British fleet conducted a test mobilisation in the Channel. War looked more and more likely. On Wednesday, August 5th, came the announcement that from 11pm on August 4th, a state of war existed between England and Germany. Recruiting was immediately started and it is the proud boast of Middlesbrough that they were the first in the country to organise an open air appeal. Within 10 days of the declaration, there was a steady stream of recruits of 450 per day. By the 7th of September, nearly 5,000 men had been enlisted. Britain was the only major power not to begin the First World War with a mass conscripted army. After the war broke out, it quickly became clear that the small professional British army was not large enough for global conflict. In order to remedy this situation, Earl Kitchener, the Secretary of State for War, laid plans to raise a new army of 70 infantry divisions. On 24th of August 1914, the Earl of Derby made a suggestion to Kitchener that men might be more willing to enlist in his new army if they could be assured of fighting alongside their own friends, neighbours and workmates. Kitchener gave his blessing to the scheme and sanctioned the raising by local councils of what became known as PALS battalions. These new battalions were usually aligned with existing city or county regiments. Uncontrolled patriotism guaranteed the success of Kitchener's scheme and inter-community rivalry led to towns and county districts seeking to recruit more pals than their neighbours. In a wave of patriotic fervour, 
Thousands of men volunteered for service in Lord Kitchener's new armies. Men from towns and cities all over Britain enlisted in their thousands. The Northern Echo of 25th of August reported that the Mayor of Middlesbrough had issued the following appeal. Arm, arm ye brave loyal men of Middlesbrough, will you defend your empire? If so, join your brother soldier to keep away our foes. On 10th of November 1914, the Mayor, W.J. Bruce, responding to a request from Major W. Fleming of Middlesbrough, wrote to Lord Kitchener requesting that a local battalion be raised. The Middlesbrough Recruiting Committee minutes of 23rd of November state that a letter had been received from the Secretary of the War Office saying it would welcome the formation of a Middlesbrough battalion. The minutes go on to say that the battalion should be known as the Teesside Pals Battalion. On 21st of December 1914, the Middlesbrough Recruiting Committee declared, We have undertaken to recruit a complete battalion of 1,200 to 1,300 men for Lord Kitchener's army. The committee wanted Colonel W. L. Vane, brother of Lord Barnard, as the commanding officer of the Teesside Battalion, but he was awaiting a more prestigious post and declined. Major Henry Rickson Betcher, a retired officer, was recommended by Colonel Watson of York. Major Betcher was born in Ballygiblin Mallow, County Cork, on 27th of July 1866. He was educated at Harrow and then joined the army. He became adjutant of the 2nd Battalion West Yorkshire Regiment from 1893 to 1897 transferred to the 1st Battalion for Militia in 1898, the year he attained the rank of Major. His service abroad was in South Africa and the East Indies. He had resigned his commission in 1907. The Mayor sent Major Betcher a telegram on Christmas Eve and on 26th of December. He received a reply accepting the post of Commanding Officer. An enthusiastic public meeting was held on the 6th of January 1915. Councillor Robert Hermiston was sworn in by the Mayor as the first member of the new 12th Teesside Battalion and on the evening of that day the first specific recruiting meeting for the battalion was held at the Town Hall. 200 men including 8 footballers formed the nucleus of the new battalion. It was announced at this meeting that Martin Hall had been acquired to billet the new recruits. This estate, sited on the outskirts of Middlesbrough, had a mansion, farm and farm buildings and was the ideal place to set up a depot and training area for the recruits. The battalion was comfortably established at Martin Hall camp. Septimus Topham, who was the last of the Teesside pioneers, dying at the age of 101 years, claimed that it was the first time that most of the recruits had ever seen a water closet. The first task they were given, when they first went into the hall, was to lay down wood duck bars over the Carrera marble floors so that it would not be broken by army boots. At first the battalion was going to be an infantry unit but the war office started to form pioneer battalions and decided to change the Teesside battalion into one of the new pioneer units. The members of the battalion were predominantly from the iron and steel industry and shipbuilding, a mixture of men experienced with picks and shovels which also included miners and roadmen and skilled artisans such as fitters, carpenters, blacksmiths, engine drivers, tinsmiths, bricklayers and masons. Pioneer battalions were intended to provide the Royal Engineers with skilled labour and to relieve the infantry on some of the non-combatant duties. As such, pioneers became the workhorses of the expeditionary forces. Adopting a badge of a cross rifle and pick, these battalions wired, dug and reverted in all weathers and in all terrain. On many occasions they abandoned their working tools and fought alongside the infantry in repelling enemy attacks. After a few weeks at Martin Hall camp, the battalion moved to Gosforth on 10th of May 1915 to continue training. 
All the time, new recruits were coming in and the numbers soon reached 1,140 of all ranks. On 13th of August, the battalion was sent to Cannock Chase in Staffordshire, where it camped on Penkridge Bank and was employed in making four new rifle ranges. From here, it went to Aldershot, joining the 40th Division as the Divisional Pioneer Battalion and moving in December to Purbright for musketry training. This was because, in addition to their pioneer duties, the Teesiders would be expected to fight if the need ever arose. Like many pioneer units, it appeared to have no fixed home, was not permanently attached to a brigade and could be called upon to fight in the line as infantry, although much of its daily load was repairing and building roads. It was not until the summer of 1916 was beginning that the Teesside Pioneers at last proceeded to France as part of the 40th Division. The Pioneers were mobilised on the 27th of May and embarked on the evening of the 1st of June at Southampton in the SS France with transport following on the Invicta. The Havre was reached early the following morning and disembarking at once they marched to number one rest camp. This was the beginning of 23 months of service. Although the 12th was now the pioneer battalion of the 40th Division, their history is not easy to trace since they belonged to no particular brigade within the division. From time to time they were attached or temporarily transferred to other divisions or areas where work of the kind for which the battalion had received special training happened to be most urgently required. Leaving Le Havre by train on the day after arrival, the battalion was almost immediately deployed to the Western Front in French Flanders. They were mainly stationed in northern France, near towns like Lens, Arras and Cambrai, in the French department of Pas de Calais, close to the Belgian border. Some of the men were attached to the 1st and 15th Divisions and some temporarily joined the 16th Division. Here they worked under the Royal Engineers, repairing the front line, trenches and roads. Duties included making shelters, clearing the field of fire and making fire steps. At the end of June, the whole battalion was concentrated at Hoochin Camp, near Lens, from where, after three days, they went to South Morocco and worked on the Cologne defences until the end of August. The battalion was then sent to Laos, where by the end of September, all main communication trenches were repaired and some poles dug up to the support line. The demand for skilled labour necessitated many moves and from the end of October through November, the battalion moved around the frontline trenches near Lance and Arras. Here they worked under the orders of 120th Brigade, then holding the Hebutern sector. Later in November, the Teesside pioneers were again moved, this time to quarters near Amiens, where the men were at last afforded some rest. This quiet period only lasted until the 8th of December, when the battalion moved by rail and road to Morapa, where it came under the orders of the Royal Engineers 15 Corps, repairing roads. On the 25th, they rejoined the 40th Division and went back to trench repair work, the trenches here being in places waist deep in mud and water. This work continued well into 1917 and it was the 27th of January before the 12th Battalion went back to camp near Bray, having during this tour had five other ranks killed and 19 men wounded. Work of a similar character to that already described went on, repairing trenches and roads and there were further mentions in dispatches. On 6th of February 1917 there was an explosion at an ammunition dump. Private H. Race was commended for saving ammunition on this occasion. On the 14th of February, Lieutenant Henry Bloom was killed by an enemy shell. Bloom was born in 1888 in Stockton, the son of a Russian-born pawnbroker. He was admitted as a solicitor in May 1912, practising in Middlesbrough. On the outbreak of war in 1914, he enlisted in the Durham University Officer Training Corps and obtained a commission in the 12th Yorkshire Regiment. He was killed while overseeing a work party in a communications trench known as a board lane. 
In April, the Commander-in-Chief congratulated the Royal Engineers of the 4th Army on their efforts in restoring communication under difficult circumstances and expressed his appreciation of the valuable assistance rendered by the pioneers and infantry of this division. By the end of April, the battalion stood at 31 officers and 814 other ranks. The work on roads and front lines went on as before throughout June and July and, the casualties being low in comparison with those of battalions more actively engaged, the drafts were small. However, on the 20th of September, the strength of the 12th Battalion was temporarily reduced by 184 non-commissioned officers and men being sent to the 4th Battalion of the Regiment. A similar number went to the 5th Battalion and 369 other ranks were received from the 1st Reserve Battalion Royal Engineers. Having now spent some considerable time in the far area, the battalion moved eastward by slow degrees to the region southwest of Cambrai. In November, the British command decided to undertake what were known as the Cambrai operations. The repeated attacks made by the Allies had brought about large enemy concentrations on certain portions of the front, with a consequent reduction of German garrisons in other sectors. It was hoped a surprise attack on one of these weakened sectors would gain a considerable local success, and of these the Combray Front had been selected. The British attack commenced on the morning of the 20th of November, when infantry and tanks advanced on a front some six miles wide. By the end of the first day, three German systems of defence had been breached to a depth of some four and a half miles and over 5,000 prisoners had already been brought in. The attack continued on the 21st and 22nd of November when it was decided that the operation should be extended with a view of gaining Boulogne to the north. It was at this point that the 40th Division were brought in. The attack began on the morning of the 23rd of November with the objective of capturing Boulogne Wood. By midday, the outskirts of Boulogne had been effectively cleared and all resistance swept away. The village itself was then cleared with a good deal of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. By 3pm, the Germans considered the Boulogne position as lost and began to bombard the place. They then commenced a series of counter-attacks from the front, from the northeast, and on the left flank from the northwest, exposing the British troops to flanking fire. Confused fighting went on for two days and nights and the division suffered over 4,000 casualties. A special divisional order was issued on the 28th of November which shows that if the 12th Battalion was perhaps not as actively engaged in the actual fighting as were some other units of the 40th Division, being employed in wiring in the front of captured positions and in repairing roads, its services were fully appreciated by High Command. The order read, Great credit is due, not only to infantry brigades who gave proof of fine fighting qualities and endurance, but also to the loyal cooperation and untiring energy shown by the Royal Artillery, the Royal Engineers and the 12th Service Battalion Yorkshire Regiment Pioneers. Early in December 1917, the battalion was camped to the south of Arras and was engaged mainly on road repairs. The weather worsened in the new year, which considerably hampered the work. Severe frost was succeeded by a thaw, followed by very wet weather, during which the parapets were continually falling in. The strength and personnel of the battalion constantly varied during January and February and, in the middle of February, it was attached for work to the 59th Division, then holding the front line. When the Great German Offensive of 1918 began, the 12th Battalion was at full strength, having just received reinforcements amounting to 115 other ranks. Early on the 21st of March, the German attack caused the battalion to stand to, and at 8.30am it marched to Clonmel Camp and manned the army line in front of Hamlin Court. 
On the 23rd, this line was handed over to the 31st Division and the battalion manned the old trenches further to the south. The hostile guns were very busy at this time and the line was heavily shelled. It was, however, held by the battalion until the evening of the 25th when it fell back further, one company forming a defensive flank to collect stragglers. These were many and the strength of the company eventually rose to 900. The command of the 12th Battalion had already twice changed hands, Major Shepherd taking charge when Colonel Betcher was wounded and when he too was injured he was relieved by Major Southey. Relieved early on the 26th, the battalion collected its components and marched west to bienville au bois arriving there at midday. Then at 2pm it was reported that the enemy had broken through the front line and the battalion was ordered to hold a defensive line around Bienville with a brigade of the 40th Division on either flank. At 10.30pm the 12th Pioneers were eventually stood down. The next day they continued a retreat west before heading north to reach Rue Abois on the evening of the 31st of March and here, so far as the battalion was concerned, the retreat ended. Major General Ponsonby, commanding the 40th Division, wrote a letter of thanks to the men in his command, acknowledging that they had done their duty like British soldiers always do and warning that we shall no doubt be called upon again to fight for all we are worth. His Majesty King George V inspected the battle-worn division and expressed his appreciation for their gallant behaviour during the recent operations, whilst also deploring the losses they had sustained. On the 2nd of April, the battalion moved to the neighbourhood of Bac saint maur close to the border with Belgium and commenced work making tramways and concrete machine gun emplacements. It then became involved in what came to be known as the Battle of the Lys. In the early hours of the 9th of April, the battalion came under heavy enemy bombardment. The companies all stood to at 6am, but it was not until 11.15am that orders came from divisional headquarters for two companies to occupy a line of trenches in front of Bac saint -Maur. A few minutes later the third company was directed to proceed to Fleurbay and reinforce the garrison of that place. By noon there was hardly a gun left in action and the line had been forced back about 2,500 yards. Realising that they needed to retire to the other side of the list, orders were given to pack up tools and medical stores in such wagons as were available in the advanced positions. Soon after midday, of the three companies of the 12th Battalion, one had taken up a position on the left bank of the list, while the other two occupied a line from Siley south to the Rue de Biache. However, they had only been in position a very short time when the enemy attacked in great strength and without support on either flank. They had to retire to avoid being surrounded. Then, after close fighting in which they captured a prisoner, these two companies eventually took up a position on the further bank of the Lys, holding on until about 4pm, when the battalion was obliged to retire for some 1,000 yards as the enemy was working round the flank. The first retirement of these two companies was covered by 2nd Lieutenant Champney and 15 other ranks with a Lewis gun and it was largely due to the very skilful way in which this officer handled his party that the withdrawal was safely effected. 2nd Lieutenant Champney kept the gun in action himself until the enemy was within 20 yards when he was killed. About 6 o'clock in the evening, a brigade of the 25th Division came up with the view of attempting to capture the enemy ground to the north. The 12th Battalion took part in this attack, advancing on the right of the brigade. However, this attack failed. The whole division had now suffered very heavily and by the evening the enemy had advanced about three miles and had reached the Lys. The battalion obtained some rest that night, then on the morning of the 10th they were back on duty. 
At 2am on this day, the previous evening's attack was repeated. This time, there was some success and the river was reached, but the enemy, counter-attacking in force, drove their assailants back to their original line and eventually into Steenwork. Here they became part of a composite battalion of the 119th Brigade. On the morning of the 11th of April, orders were received to retire to a reserve line behind Strasil. The battalion had suffered the great loss of three officers and 28 other ranks killed, four officers and 154 non-commissioned officers and men wounded, one officer and 18 men wounded and missing, and two officers and 117 other ranks unaccounted for. A total of 327 casualties. The battalion remained in reserve at Strasil with the 119th Brigade sending out patrols along the roads, with the rest of the battalion employed in digging a series of strong points on Strasil Ridge. As they had now spent four days and four nights in fighting a rearguard action and retreating, they were glad when their division, which had already suffered heavily in the March offensive, was ordered to withdraw to rest in the saint Omer area. For the rest of April, the battalion remained with the 119th Infantry Brigade. Then, on the 5th of May, the 12th Battalion of the Yorkshire Regiment was broken up and formed into a battalion training staff composed of 10 officers and 51 other ranks. On the same day, 10 officers and 350 non-commissioned officers and men were sent by train to the base depot at Calais. On the 28th of June, what remained of the battalion training staff was absorbed into the 17th Garrison Battalion, the Worcestershire Regiment, of which Lieutenant Colonel H.W. Betcher assumed command and the 12th Battalion Teesside Pioneers ceased to exist. The total active service life of the 12th Battalion was 41 months and it carried the name of the area where it was formed for all of that time. It was part of a colossal wave of men from all over the British Isles who served during the Great War. It started life as an infantry battalion but very quickly turned into a pioneer unit and in a sense represented the area of heavy industry from which it sprang. The battalion members were the artisans who worked in iron and steel, iron mining, shipbuilding and engineering. The battalion started with between 200 to 300 men and a solitary officer. Apart from his periods of leave, brief secondments, Major Henry Betcher remained and offered continuity in the command of the battalion. In terms of leadership, this retired officer who came back into service was very influential and he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order in April 1917. Recognition of the battalion's effectiveness can be seen in Field Marshal Haig's dispatch of 9th of April 1917 which mentions Lieutenant Colonel Betcher, Lieutenant Crosby and RSM Milner. These were not the only mentions that the battalion and individuals had in the field marshal's dispatches. The battalion's relationship with the town appeared to undergo a change. Initially, the motivation behind its formation seems to have been a mixture of municipal pride, the need to compete with other towns and cities that were raising their own battalions and the jingoistic euphoria of the time. At first the local press, in the form of the North Eastern Daily Evening Gazette, gave it a great amount of coverage. After the battalion left for France in June 1916, it is hard to find a reference to it for the next two years. There is an edition of the Sports Gazette, published on the 15th of March 1915, which related deaths of soldiers who were local sportsmen, but this was before the battalion went to France. There was not one reference to the 12th Battalion which had eight Middlesbrough Football Club members in it. 
Local papers did record deaths and gave some insights into what was happening in the war and the Daily Gazette certainly did receive information from families and relatives of soldiers serving abroad. It would then print this information but in a very subdued and small column, any impact lost by the dull presentation and writing style. There are no references in the council archives to the 12th Battalion after it moved to France or when it was broken up, nor do the three local histories of Middlesbrough refer to it in, after its formation. So in corporate and local circles, after its move to France, the 12th Battalion appeared to become a lost or forgotten battalion. The Teesside pioneers achieved a successful integration into the British Army at the Western Front, when it was thrown into action after 11 months of training. At the end, it can be seen that there are mentions in dispatches for it as a unit, as well as individuals. There were also letters of commendation from senior military officers praising the work it carried out and the bravery of the men. When it was called upon to act as a conventional infantry battalion, it responded immediately and at some cost. During April 1918, the 12th Battalion Service Yorkshire Regiment Teesside Pioneers suffered over 300 casualties. Nearly 80 of these were killed in action or subsequently died of wounds. This was, for a volunteer pioneer unit, an unusually high figure, but it was the consequence of the unit being involved for several days in the Battle of Lys. Pioneers were intended to work and support the Royal Engineer Field Companies and the infantry rather than fight as frontline troops. The mauling that the pioneers had taken was so severe that in May 1918 it was reduced to care de size and then absorbed by the 17th Worcester Regiment. Medals were awarded to individuals in the battalion. In June 1917, Lieutenant Colonel Betcher was awarded the DSO and Sergeant F. McGann the Distinguished Conduct Medal. In January 1918, Captain Harris was posthumously awarded a military cross for his action at Bolon Wood. Sergeant J. Jackson was awarded a DCM and RSM W. Milner, already mentioned in dispatches, received a Belgian Croix de Guerre. Captain Crosby, who was mentioned in dispatches on two occasions, also received a military cross. On 2nd of April 1919, the first meeting of the War Memorial Official Committee, which included Alderman W. Bruce, the original raiser of the 12th Battalion, met to promote a fund for the establishment of a war memorial to perpetuate the memory of the Middlesbrough men who had fallen in the war and also as a permanent record of those Middlesbrough men who had happily survived. After much debate and numerous suggestions, the council decided on the construction of a cenotaph. In all the minutes of the committee meetings, there is no mention of the 12th Battalion or any of its fallen soldiers. This perhaps reflected a period of time when the public wanted to forget the war and its implications. Sadly, the town's local battalion, 12th Service Yorkshire Regiment Teesside Pioneers, was not remembered in any specific public way. After the war, ex-members of the battalion maintained contact by attending regular reunions. One of the last to be held was on the 8th of March 1958 in Middlesbrough. Although the battalion had a relatively short life, the impression it and wartime service made on its surviving members was very powerful. That is the end of the story in which young men from Teesside gave their lives for king and country. For four and a half years, the people of Teesside lived with the smell of death as relatives, friends and neighbours were all killed at the Western Front. Sergeant Harry Cook, a Middlesbrough footballer who had a career as a teacher planned, would never be able to help those future pupils. Lieutenant Henry Bloom could never go back to the family business in Middlesbrough. 
2nd Lieutenant Champney would never celebrate his 21st birthday and his coming of age. They were all heroes, those who started this military journey in Teesside and ended forever in France.